Good morning, this is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have you following along as we go through the uh, as we go through the Lent season, we are remembering again. Uh, and, and it's something that, it, that it's good to be reminded of, actually every day, of the cost that was paid for our forgiveness. It's a free forgiveness. And, and many times in life we think of something free as being something cheap. And our forgiveness was not cheap at all. The cost was incredibly high. It was higher than any of us could pay. It's, it was higher than the richest person who ever has lived on this planet could, could begin to, play, to pay. So while it is free to us, it is by no means cheap. And it, it is good for us as we go through these uh, scriptures to be reminded and, and, and to remind ourselves on our own hearts of the cost of that sacrifice so that, so that we can respond with appropriate thankfulness. Uh, we'll, we'll be reading today from Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 38, and the title of the message is Willing Sacrifice. Uh, before we read, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word. And as we read your word, ask that you would let, that we would let your word read our hearts and read our thoughts and read our attitudes and cleanse us from everything and anything that keeps us from holding back, from responding in gratitude and thanksgiving and humility. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 22, 31 through 38. <clears throat> now this is after the Lord's Supper, and the disciples have, have argued about which one of them is going to be the greatest. Um, and the subject shifts here. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he, Peter, said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now, he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, in verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon. <clears throat> now, Simon's name had been changed by Jesus to Peter, which is Greek for a rock. Uh, and it had been named to Petros, which is, is Greek for a smaller rock. Petra is, is a huge rock. It's a boulder, like, like the rock of Gibraltar. It's like a foundation stone. But Petro, Petros is a smaller rock. I mean, it can range anything from a pebble to, to something that you couldn't move without help, but, but it's still a smaller rock than a massive boulder. Um, so, but both are names of strength and stability and unchangeableness. Um, Jesus is using his former name, his name that's associated with, 
Well, uh, a lot of times this is this is something that we see in in the record of of a large portion of Peter's life, which is probably why a lot of us can really relate to Peter. He's impulsive. He opens his mouth to stick his foot in it. He just blurts out what he thinks is is a good thing to say it, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. (laughs) But he's an impulsive sort of a guy, and I think a lot of us can really relate to old Pete. Uh, But he's using a name, this, this... warning Peter of what's going to happen, giving him the advan- the, uh, the heads up on it. Then he goes on to say, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, the word that's translated, we're reading from the New King James. The, the King James says Satan has desired you, which is a more intensive word and probably more appropriate here. But actually, the, the word that's used, used here is actually a legal term that would relate to an extradition. Now, there is a word you don't hear all the time. Well, maybe if you work in a you know, police station or a lawyer's office, you might hear it more often. But it's a legal term. It's a claim or demand that, that a prisoner be returned to their home state or their their home country or some other state or country than they're currently in for trial. So you have a picture here of Satan, whose name literally means accuser, demanding Peter for the purpose of trial, demanding him, not just demanding him, but demanding him back, back to that place of weakness back to that place of impulsiveness. And then he says, Satan has demanded you or desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Um, And now, again, this is something that would have been very, very familiar to the hearers of Jesus' day and not so much to most of us. I mean, there's probably very few people in a modern country that sift their wheat. There might be some uh, who want to make sure that they have the freshest wheat possible, and so they grow their own wheat and harvest their own wheat and sift it to get the, the dirt and the chaff off of it. But you shake it vigorously in a sieve so that all the, the foreign particles fall away. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 speaks of the purpose of trials. And and Jesus is warning Peter he's going to go through a trial. And he speaks of the enemy that we all face. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Jesus is warning Peter that Satan has demanded him or desired him that he may, he wants to to destroy him. Now, let's be honest. Most of us, if we had our choice, would rather go through life without trials. Now, we may recognize that benefits can come through trials. And even with that recognition, it's not something that we look forward to. Oh, goody, I'm going to go have a trial. I don't think so. I'm going to go through a time of suffering and hardship and difficulty. I don't think so. Excuse me. But God not only allows us to go through trials, but sometimes he himself will bring trials upon us so that we can have those things shaken from us that need to be shaken from us. 
you probably would not want to harvest some wheat and just run it through a grinder without shaking it to remove the dust and the bugs and everything else. You probably wouldn't want to just run it through the grinder, dust and bugs and all, and make bread out of it. I don't think you would find that very appetizing. I know I wouldn't. If somebody served me bread made that way, I'd probably rather not know about it. <laughs> but anyway, so God will not only allow us to go through trials, but there are instances in when he, when he will actually put us through a trial for the purpose of shaking away those things that are pollutants, those things that cling to us. Now, the same trial that God allows or even puts us through in order to purify us, Satan will try to use as a means of temptation to try to entice us to evil. He'll come along and say, I have a way out of this trial. You don't have to go through this. You can do this. You can, you, you can do this that, that's in disobedience to God. You know, I've got a quick way out for you. Uh, you don't have to go through all this hassle. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Satan uses the trial that God intends for our, our good, for us to shake off the evil things, to try to entice us to do evil. And Jesus is warning Peter of this. In Peter's epistle, written a few decades later, he's warning the believers of that time and us to be vigilant and be sober because we face an enemy who is going to try to <clears throat> deceive us through those trials. Now, the analogy of a sieve or shaking in a sieve is used in Amos 9, verse 9. Now, Amos is one of the minor prophets, not minor because his prophecy was less important, but his prophecy was shorter. He's, he's not as well-known as some of the major prophets like Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, <coughs> Isaiah. But Amos, chapter 9, verse 9. For surely I will command and sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. Throughout most of Amos' prophecy, he has brought a message of judgment that Israel is going to go into captivity because of their continued disobedience to God. But even in the midst of this judgment, this trial, this shaking, he has this promise that not even the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. They, <clears throat> that when God puts us through or allows us to go through, either one, that period of shaking, it is not that he may destroy us, but that he may cleanse us and purify us. Back to Luke 22. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. John 17. <clears throat> and and I, I will go to that, but I won't read all of it. But I'd like to read some verses from it. Is Jesus' prayer during this time for his disciples, including Peter? John 17. And I, I do encourage you to read the, the entire chapter. But I would like to read a few verses Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. He's speaking to the Father, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. The purpose that God doesn't take us home, now it, it would be sad for our families if, if when somebody became a Christian if they immediately went home to be with the Lord. It would be really sad for the families. But the purpose that God continues to leave us here is that he may be glorified, Jesus says, in them, in you, in me. 
that our lives may reflect, however imperfectly, his glory, his holiness, his mercy, his love. Uh, and then he go, he's still praying. I, I, skipping on to verse 13. But now I come to you. He's speaking to the Father. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now, is Jesus here praying that we won't feel the attacks of the evil one? No, he's not praying that at all. He is praying that you will keep them. Keep would be, uh, could be translated guard, protect. We will go through those times of difficulty and trial. And Jesus said even hatred. That's not something anybody likes. Nobody wants to be hated. But we will go through those times if we are faithful. Because Jesus, who was perfect and is perfect, went through hatred. Not because of something wrong he had done. But because he was light. And darkness hates light. I mean, we, we have, in our own lives, we have a... a uh, kind of a physical example of that is if you're sleeping soundly and having a wonderful dream and it's dark and somebody turns on a really bright light and wakes you up is your first thought oh goody I get to get up no that's not your first thought I guarantee it's not your first thought <laughs> especially if it's cold out and you're under some nice warm covers yeah that's not your first thought at all but so darkness hates light and so we should not be surprised if 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 in faithfulness we face hatred now if we face hatred because we're not faithful if we face hatred because we're acting we're, we're treating others in a way that is not in accord with how jesus would have us to treat them then we need to receive God's correction and we need to be changed because then we're not reflecting his glory. In this scripture or in this promise, Jesus promises two things to Peter. He says, I'm praying for you. And he says, when you have returned. Now, now we'll go more to this in a later sermon, but in this, Peter is given hope that when he has denied the Lord those three times, that there will be a returning. And in John 21, 15 through 17, you see that described. So when they had eaten breakfast, the disciples see Jesus on the shore Jesus said specifically to Simon Peter Simon son of Jonah do you love me more than these he said to him yes Lord you know that I love you he said to him feed my lambs he said to him the second time Simon son of Jonah do you love me he said to him yes Lord you know that I love you he said to him tend my sheep he said to him the third time Simon son of Jonah do you love me Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time do you love me and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And you see this, this promise fulfilled, especially on the day of Pentecost, some, some 40 days later, when the same Peter, who had cowered back from affirming his Savior, before a servant girl stands up and boldly speaks to a hostile crowd about Jesus as the Messiah, 
as the one who had been crucified by their hands, by our hands, but had shown his glory by rising from the dead. So you see this enormous change in Peter. Back to Luke 22. Verse 33, now Peter, good old impulsive Peter, says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And I really don't believe that Peter was holding back anything. I mean, I don't know this, of course, but I don't, I don't think Peter was holding back anything. Peter was an impulsive guy. And I'm, I'm almost certain that he thought he was quite ready to go with Jesus, both to prison and to death. Then Jesus said in verse 34, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. <clears throat> and now you have a parallel description of this in Matthew 26, 33 through 35, Mark 14, 29 through 31, and John 13, 37 and 38. Uh, I do encourage you to look those up on your own. But we're going on. To verse 35. Then Jesus said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, Nothing. Now, <clears throat> Jesus is referring to a couple of, of training journeys, missionary journeys that Jesus had given to the disciples earlier. You can read about them in Matthew 10. 5 through 15, in Mark 6, 7 through 9, which I'd like to read, and in Luke 9, 1 through 6. But I'm reading from Mark 6, 7 through 9. Now, this first journey is with the 12 disciples that we refer to as the apostles. Mark 6, 7 through 9. I went to didn't go far enough here. Okay, Mark 6, 7 through 9. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. For he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And then he goes on to give further instructions as to, to how they are to, to conduct their teaching journey. But one thing I would like to point out is this, that he gave them power over unclean spirits. Now, <clears throat> there are a couple of, at least a couple, of, of false ways that people deal with the idea of unclean spirits. One is to deny it, to say there's no such thing. There's no such thing as unclean spirits. There's no such things as demons. There's no, no such thing as that. And that's, uh, that is just plain not true. Now, granted, us sinful human beings can get into a lot of trouble all on our own, out of our own selfish hearts. A, a lot of temptations don't require any sort of outside intervention whatsoever. It can just be as simple as, I see something and I want it, and I don't care what I, as long as I can get by with it, I don't care what it takes to get it. That's just kind of part of the old sinful nature, and it, it doesn't really require some spiritual force outside of me to encourage that. But there are those unclean spirits, those demonic forces that do work in people's lives. And I'd like to point out just briefly, this is not going to be a, a sermon on unclean spirits. Um, two things is that he gave them power. He gave them power. He didn't say, you take them on yourself. That is spiritual suicide. Because if, if you think, I'm, I'm spiritual enough, I'm smart enough to take on an unclean spirit by myself, it's been around a lot longer than you have. And it is not omnipotent, but it does know your behavior. It knows the things you have fallen for in the past, and it, is, it, it, it has no moral compunction against using those things again and making them look even more attractive. 
So, so whatever it's been in your past, and it varies from person to person. I mean, some things are fairly universal, but it does vary from person to person. Whatever it's been, an unclean spirit is, is quite willing to use those things to try to suck us in. And we are foolish to try to take it on by ourselves. It is Jesus that gives us that power, and only Jesus that gives us that power. The other mistake people make is a fascination with this. Ooh, I gotta go to this seminar about the, the different levels of demons and these different these different things you can say to cast out unclean spirits and a fascination with the occult and and this is really fascinating and really cool and um and, and people get into all kinds of horrible darkness seduced by that the, the one one of the more attractive things in that is white witchcraft the idea of you can use this power to achieve good well you may think you're achieving good but you're opening yourself up for incredible destructive deception and so jesus is giving his disciples power through him over these things but I would also like to read from Luke 10, 1 through 12. Now, this is a different journey that only Luke's gospel tells about. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus had done some teaching, and he had sent the 12 disciples out. The Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two before his face into every place where he himself was about to go. So the first time he sends out 12, the second time he sends out 70. Again, two by two, so that they're there to support each other. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Again, he's specifying that the power that we have is not because we're so big and bad, but because his protection is on us. I mean, you send out a flock of sheep into a bunch of wolves, and the wolves are going to say, ooh, a buffet. <clears throat> so the, the only way those sheep can go safely among those wolves is if they have a strong shepherd with them. If we as sheep try to deal with the wolves of life in ourselves, we're going to be eaten up. We have to be walking with the shepherd. Then he gives the same basic instructions. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no, long, no one along the road. Goes on to give further instruction. <clears throat> in verse 9, and heal the sick there in the cities where they go, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. And they're, they're sent out to proclaim that, that Jesus is coming. So that they, they are sent basically as advance messengers. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of, of God has come near you. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. <coughs> Excuse me. So Jesus is pointing out at that time, and in our time, the importance of, of understanding and receiving his word. Okay, reading on in Luke 22. <clears throat> he has reminded them that when he sent them out, both the 12 and the 70, without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, that they were provided for. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment. And buy one. <clears throat> but I say, but this I say to you, that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. Now numbered is the Greek word legitsomai, which I probably did not pronounce right at all. But an English word from the same root 
is logic. Means it means to consider, to esteem, or to despise. It, but it means to consider deeply. It literally means to number. It's an accounting term. Um, in, in, in your household expenses, you may or may not care about how every penny is spent. Uh, some some people are, are have a more uh, organized mind in that than others. On the other hand, if you're making a business investment and you're expecting to receive money back, you're probably going to be very, very concerned as to how the money is spent on what, in what stocks and bonds, and you know what it's invested in. For one thing, you probably don't want to invest in anything that you believe strongly is not a good thing to invest in. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you, and you also don't want to continue investing in things that don't return a profit. So it's an accounting term. In Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 and 11 and 12, we have, <clears throat> we have a prophecy, and, and we read this in our responsive reading, where Jesus was accounted, he was numbered with the transgressors. Um, he was accounted as being a transgressor. And you see that in the accusation written <clears throat> over him on the cross. In Matthew 27, 38, and Mark 15, 28, you had the same accounting of Jesus being considered as a transgressor. Verse 38, so he, but he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. They have a completion they will be completely fulfilled. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now the word swords, there are a couple of words that could be translated swords. One was, one was the, long, the long Roman sword that was used in attacking an enemy force. And basically it would, it would stick out behind uh, the shield because in the Roman army they had shields which would cover just about the entire body except for just a little bit of the eyes and the top of the head. You could put that shield down and it was almost like a, a portable wall you could hide behind and, and be safe from an enemy attack. They had the long sword that they used for that. They also had the short sword which was used for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now that's the sword that's referred to here. And the short sword was actually more useful in daily living for a Roman soldier and everybody else because you know if you had some butchering to do if you had to skin your meal and in, in those times if you wanted fresh meat you had to skin it or you had to buy it from somebody that skinned it and cut it up into pieces well that's pretty hard to manage if you've got a three-foot sword but if you have a, a short sword or a dagger that's 12 to 18 inches, it's much more manageable to do. Uh, and that's the type of sword they were using. Now, as you read on, Jesus tells them specifically to bring a sword. And they bring a sword. You know, they said, we, ha we have two swords. And he said, that's enough. That's sufficient. And later on, you find that Peter uses the sword that he has. And what does Jesus tell him? Put away your sword. So why would Jesus tell the disciples to bring swords and when it came to an actual clash, tell them to put away the sword? Well, one reason is that Jesus, and in some of the ancient translations, Jesus is described as a victim. Now, Victim is a word that has shifted in English. And while that was accurate enough in the 1500s and 1600s, it was a perfectly acceptable, accurate terminology. But in modern usage, for well over 100 years, a victim is not somebody who willingly goes into a situation, but a victim is somebody who is unable to do anything to stop it. 
Jesus was completely able on both a physical and a spiritual level to stop what was happening to him. He went not as a victim, but as a willing sacrifice. And part of showing that he was going as a willing sacrifice is that the disciples did have the physical means to stop it, or at least to hinder it. <clears throat> and Jesus told them to put their swords down, to put away their swords, that he was going for it on his own. And so Jesus offered himself as that willing sacrifice for our sins. Amen. Father, we thank you so much that you are willing to pay the penalty for our sins, for my sins, for everything that we have ever done in our hearts or in our bodies that would grieve your spirit, that would be against your will and against your specific commandments, that you took upon yourself the penalty of every one of those things so that we might have the ability to be numbered, to be accounted as righteous, not because of any righteousness we have, but because of your righteousness. We thank you so much for that. We ask that you'd work in our hearts as we ponder these things, as we meditate on your word to purify us, to shake us from everything that runs contrary to you and to cleanse us that we may be reflections of you. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you very much. God bless you.